Hello and welcome to Celebrate Messiah New Zealand's audio library. Today we're bringing you the recordings from our recent 2023 Simca conference in Palmerston North featuring Dr. Tim Sigler. Dr. Sigler possesses a remarkable 35-year track record of imparting knowledge about the land and the people of Israel. He spent two decades of teaching at the Moody Bible Institute, has more than seven years of pastoral experience in the United States, and has spent significant period of residence and work in Israel, including contributions to the Israel College of the Bible. Tim joins us for Simca as the new co-executive director of Ariel Ministries. We hope you enjoy our series of messages from our conference, and thank you for listening. I'd like to introduce Tim Sigler as best I can, and I'm going to read a little bit of a bio that I found from him, and then share a little bit more. Um, Dr. Tim Sigler is pleased to enjoy the mentorship of Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum in preparation to lead the global efforts of Ariel Ministries. That's right, if you're familiar with uh, Dr. Fruchtenbaum, Dr. Tim Sigler is basically being raised up to take over and continue the ministry forward for Dr. Fruchtenbaum. He has been studying and teaching about the land and people of Israel for over 35 years. He hosts educational tours throughout the biblical world through Wisdom Passages, his ministry. His background in pastoral ministry and leadership in higher education has prepared him to serve on several Jewish ministry boards. He has, he's the provost uh, dean at Shepherd's Theological Seminary in Cary, North Carolina. After uh, nearly two decades at the Moody Bible Institute um, as a professor of Hebrew and Biblical Studies, and he continues to be visiting faculty at several institutions. Tim's writing, written contributions have been appeared in Ariel Magazine, Trinity Journal, Messianic Perspectives, Mishkan, uh, the Bulletin of Luzon Consultation on Jewish Evangelism as well as uh, Messianic Jewish Study Bible, Chronological Life Application Bible, Messianic Jewish Edition, uh, the, the Moody, Bi Moody uh, Bible Commentary, a Dictionary on Daily Life in Biblical and Post-Biblical Antiquities, um, What Should We Think About Israel, Separating Fact from Fiction Over the Middle East Conflict, in, um, and the Shepherd Seminary volume titled Forsaking Israel, how it happened and why it matters. He, is, um, he has his hospitable wife, Bernice, here, and they have three adventurous uh, young adult children and enjoy speaking Hebrew at home. So, Dr. Tim Siegler, and where is your lovelier, better half, if I may? Hello. <laughs> so that is Bernice. Please get to know her. Um, we actually had a wonderful time last night. We were at Margaret Song's house. Margaret, thank you so much for hosting us. And we got into quite a hymn sing, and it just kept going and going and going, and it was really fun to be all together. But when I was asking Tim for a little bit of a bio to let you know his background, his first response was, that he wanted to be known as an Israelite, <laughs> sorry, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. That's a direct quote from John 147. In the story where um, the early disciples are coming together and they're beginning to realize that Jesus is actually the Messiah, the one written about by Moses and the prophets. And um, Philip goes and finds Nathaniel and he says, come on, you've got to see this guy. And you don't know, at first you don't really know what's going on, but what you realize from the context is Nathaniel is sitting beneath the fig tree praying to understand God and who he is, to under, get an understanding of his Messiah. And then when he finally comes and see, Jesus says to him, he says, uh, behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Nathaniel looked at him and he said, how do you know me? Jesus answered and said, before Philip called you, I saw you while you were under the, fi while you were under the fig tree. I, I saw you. And I think the reason this is exciting to me is I think the lead qualification of Tim Siegler isn't all the paper, isn't all the degrees. We're grateful for all that. But it's the fact that he's been pursuing God for a long time, and God has chosen to reveal his son to him. So, Dr. Siegler, why don't you come on up? 
Um, uh, this first session is called Israel's Current Conflict. If you do not have handouts, could you raise your hand because you'll want, um, want to do that. Well, thank you for that warm, if tentative, uh, 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 greeting. It is good to be with you here, and I look forward to sharing with you. In fact, after that kind introduction, I can't wait to hear what I have to say. So please take your handouts, and uh, a little word of introduction again. You've uh, met my wife, but our three precious children are... Uh, thankfully at home praying for our trip and uh, staying in communication with us. We love to say about our kids, they all love the Lord and they love us and we're trying not to mess that up. When they were younger, we took them to Israel when I had a sabbatical from Moody Bible Institute. They gave us the uh, nine months of the academic year, but we took also the three months before and the three months after. Perhaps you heard that the three best things about a teaching job Uh, at least in the States, are June, July, and August. And so we would add those to the nine months of the academic uh, sabbatical, and we lived in Israel for 15 months. During that time, we tossed our younger kids into the deep end of the pool, where they cried something like four months, but then they cried in Hebrew. And I said, see how fun it is to be bilingual? And now we speak Hebrew in the home, and uh, they go back with us each year as we continue to both lead educational tours and do ministry in the land. Uh, Before my wife and I met each other, we also both separately studied in Israel. In fact, I went first for an academic year and then came back to the States. Then she went to Israel for the summer term, and then she came back to the States. So I tell people she chased me clear around the world before I caught her. Well, now we've been married 32 years, and uh, we continue to have a great love for Israel together. And thus, when these terrible events happened on October 7, all of us were heartbroken. Our children, of course, uh, the younger two, are at an age where all of the friends that they grew up going to school with within Israel Uh, they would come back each summer and re-enter their class and uh, finish the school year in Israel through their grade school years. And so their friends are on the front lines. One of these young kids that grew up in our home, he's a tank commander today. And others are experiencing the front lines of this terrible situation. In fact, the verse that came to mind that very Shabbat on which this happened Come from Psalm 120, verse 7. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. You see, on October 7, Hamas launched a surprise attack against Israel by land, sea, and air, infiltrating and overtaking towns and villages near the Gaza border and brutally murdering innocent civilians. I don't have to remind you, I trust, because you've seen it in the news, and I hope you are well aware that on that day more Jewish lives were lost than on any other day since the Holocaust. As the Prime Minister of Israel attempted to uh, alert the citizens to the seriousness of this moment, he announced, citizens of Israel, we are at war. Not an operation, not just another round of fighting, at war. And, And friends, lest any of us are unfamiliar with just how serious this is. Perhaps you see your news feeds on a regular basis. You know, um, you read about inner city gang violence or scandal in the parliament or, or uh, Hamas missiles to Israel, Hezbollah rocket attacks in the north. You know, skip, skip, skip. Yeah, we've seen this before. Can I just say this is not that. This is nothing that has happened before in the history of the modern state. And for this reason... A pastor friend in the Washington, D.C. area called up. He wrote me first and said, is there any way over any of the next five Sundays in a row, I'll open any Sunday that you're available. Can you please come to us and provide all three Sunday morning messages? Plus, if you could stay for the Sunday evening, do a seminar and a QA and a at the end and, and try to address these issues. Like, could you help us understand why is Israel special to God? Who are the Palestinians? Are the Jews occupiers of Palestinian land? Who is Hamas? Why are they terrorists? Is what we're seeing on the news in the past few weeks the fulfillment of Bible prophecy? Is Ezekiel 38 unfolding before our very eyes? And I thought, all in one message? Uh, uh, there's a lot going on there, but uh, I thought, you know, he said it like this, 
our people simply are not prepared to address these issues, probably because pastors like me have not been preaching about them regularly. So could you please come? And I said, the only time I could come is this coming Sunday. I'll change my flight from this city to that city, and I'll be there. And, and so we tried to put it under one title, which now I'm sharing with you as this message, Israel's Current Conflict and God's Eternal Plan. So because there's a lot of ground to cover, uh, maybe this is like a flyover of information and thus, I'd invite you to buckle your seatbelts, to place your tray table in the upright and locked position, place any uh, carry-on baggage in the overhead bin or under the seat in front of you, and we're going to fly through this material. We'll save any questions for the break. I'll be available all day. Feel free to agree, disagree, correct, inform me, uh, challenge, and um, there we go. But for now, let's address these topics. The first, why is Israel? special to God. Well, I want to turn to the New Testament first because many approaches to Christian theology have said, well, of course, well, any of those verses from the Old Testament, they are in some ways irrelevant to the Christian message. So I'd like to address it from the New Testament first because I personally don't agree with that view. Romans chapter 11 verses 28 to 32 puts it like this. From the standpoint of the gospel, they, meaning Jewish people who do not believe in the Messiahship of Jesus, they, which would be the majority of Jewish people, are ideological enemies, meaning enemies for your sake when it comes to the gospel. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are, class you say it, irrevocable. God gave these promises to the patriarchs, the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, repeating them on throughout the nation's history. And his gifts of his promises and his calling are irrevocable. Uh, We could turn back a couple of chapters, also in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 9, verses 3 to 5. For I could wish that I myself, Paul says, were a curse, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, his own countrymen, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. And then he goes on to describe... Well, who are Israelites? Who are the Jewish people? To them belongs the adoption of sons. In other words, the Jewish people are called out by God for his special purposes, brought into his family of faith for his purposes. To them belongs the glory. This is the Shekinah, the presence of God that dwelt in the tabernacle and later the temple. And the covenants, these would be the biblical covenants about which we read in the scriptures, in the Hebrew scriptures. If we didn't have the Hebrew scriptures, we wouldn't know anything about these biblical covenants. But think of some of these covenants, like the Abrahamic covenant, uh, the Mosaic or land covenant uh, at Mount Sinai, the Davidic covenant, even the new covenant is made, Jeremiah 31, verse 31, with the house of Judah and with the house of Israel. These are the Israelites to whom are given the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. Whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is over all God blessed forever. Of course, this causes Paul to worship in this very moment as he's recounting all the ways that God has blessed Israel and utilized the fact of Israel throughout human history to bring us both the scriptures about which Without which, we would, uh, without which we would not know about any of these things, and to bring us the Savior. Through the Jewish people, he's given both the Scriptures and the Savior. If we would turn back to Second Chronicles chapter 6, we would read that since the day, this is the Lord himself speaking, since the day that I brought my people from the land of Egypt, I did not choose a city out of all the tribes of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there. Nor did I choose any man for a leader over my people Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. In other words, a special choice even within Israel of a certain city and then even within the people of Israel of a certain line through which the Messiah would come. God's choice of Israel is clear throughout Scripture. In fact, Zechariah chapter 2 puts it like this. To those who were dwelling in the Babylonian captivity but on their way back to the promised land, God raises up Zechariah to encourage people that the Lord has not forgotten them in captivity. And he says through the prophet, up, 
escape to Zion. You who dwell with the daughter of Babylon, for thus said the Lord of hosts after his glory, sent me to the nations who plundered you. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Behold, I will shake my hand over them and they shall become plunder for those who serve them. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. Catch this from verse 8. He who touches you touches the apple of his eye. In other words, to attack Zion, to touch Jerusalem, to go against those whom God has given his favor to, is as if one is poking God's own eye. And friends, that's exactly what has happened here recently. Who are the Palestinians? The origin of the term Palestine comes from a period roughly around 132 AD. Perhaps you'll recall that the Romans were in control of the land during the time of the birth of Messiah Jesus. For some time, their Roman rulers had been uh, overseeing the various regions throughout the Middle East. The Roman Empire had spread over its rule over a vast amount of territory. But there were these people, the Jewish people, who consistently rebelled against their authority, especially when they put restrictions upon worshiping at the temple in Jerusalem. And yet the Romans were not a group with which to be trifled. And thus, they decided to put down Jewish rebels in a number of ways. And many of these things are recorded throughout history. You'll recall, of course, that the temple is ultimately destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. But that wasn't all. You see, the Jewish people had had their temple defiled previously by the Greeks. You'll remember the story of the Maccabees and the holiday of its rededication at Hanukkah. There was hope that perhaps you could fight back these Romans who would destroy the temple. The temple could be rebuilt and it could be rededicated and life could return for the Jewish people. But that was not going to be the case. During the time roughly around the Bar Kokhba revolt, the Romans finally said, we have to stomp these rebels down one last time. They renamed the entire land Palestine, Palestina in Latin. And they renamed the city of Jerusalem, emotional extra credit if anyone can remember what they named Jerusalem. Let me just let you know, it didn't sound very Jewish. They wanted to wipe away any memory of the Jewish people having been there. So no longer would it be called Jerusalem or Jerusalem. This city would now be named Elia Capitolina which sounds not very Jewish. In fact, it sounds like something you might read off a menu in a fine Italian restaurant. I'll have the marinara sauce added to number 13, the Alia Capitolina, please. No, Alia Capitolina renamed the city after Hadrian himself and called it his capital city. And thus, while the name Alia Capitolina did not stick, unfortunately, his renaming of Palestine did stick. The Romans were pretty good historians, and he didn't just make this name up out of thin air. He renamed it after an ancient people group who was no longer present to rebel against Roman authority. He he named it after the ancient Philistines. You might notice the similarity of the consonants. The P, like a PH sound, the Palestine-Philistine connection, is simply to recall that there was this group. And I have the map here showing the Sea People's movement and their rise. They came from an area near the seas of Greece and settled in various shores around the Mediterranean Sea. And those who settled to the north of Israel in modern-day Lebanon were known as the Phoenicians. But those who settled to the south in the area near Gaza, Ashkelon, Ashdod, Gath and Ekron, the five cities of the Philistine Pentapolis, these were known as the Peleshet or Philistines. The Romans said, hey, uh, these people are no longer here. They'll never rebel against us. And they knew this. How? Well, because the Hebrew scriptures tell about the Philistines. Perhaps you'll recall that great battle between David and Goliath. 
And you'll also note that soon after that battle, there was never a serious threat by the Philistines. Again, they kind of washed off the face of human history. Their culture was not present. Their language was not present. They just kind of went the way of many ancient civilizations. Perhaps you'll recall how that battle ended after David flung the stone from his sling. I think the text in a rabbinical commentary says that Goliath said that something uh, struck him that never entered his mind before. And uh, that was really the end of the problem of the Philistines. Well, this term then, the Philistines, was reused to rename this land. Further, the term Palestine since that time referred to the land and the people who dwelt in the land, whether Jews or Arabs, whether Christians or Muslims at a much later date, Muslims, uh, anyone who would have called themselves residents in this land would have been considered a Palestinian. In fact, there are two editions of the Jewish Talmud, this encyclopedic set of rabbinic commentary. One that is even more authoritative than the other and often studied in the various yeshivas and Jewish schools is the Babylonian Talmud. But another written in Jerusalem was known as the Palestinian Talmud. I can guarantee you they weren't claiming to be Arabs when they called themselves the writers of the Palestinian Talmud. In fact, here's a newspaper. I noticed that it can be purchased. This very original copy of the Palestine Post from May 14, 1948, when the state of Israel was born. It was published in this Jewish newspaper called the Palestine Post. You can buy a copy on eBay, at least you could two weeks ago, for $1,000 U.S. Now, additionally, who are the Palestinians? There are often claims of indigenous culture where the Palestinians are the ones who are holding up a map like this showing that the green area shows where Palestinians, where and they're claiming to be the true Palestinians, to be the, the rightful indigenous people of this land, uh, were present in all of these places. But after the UN partition plan of 1947 to give the Jewish people a, 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 a bit of land to establish the Jewish state there after the Holocaust, then you'll notice the green areas shrink. And then after the 67 war, well, then you have the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. And then, you know, in more modern times, a continuously shrinking area of indigenous land. But I'd like to suggest to you that this is a completely fabricated inaccuracy. When you excavate in Israel with the archaeologists, what do you know? you find Jewish artifacts and Hebrew texts. You do not find, like you would in the Americas, copies of Shakespeare when you dig underground. You see, there are indigenous cultures in various places, but the indigenous culture to this land would be the Hebrew people, the Jewish people. Much more could be said about this you know, Israel would fit inside of New Zealand ten times. I think, how do you say it here, brother? About half the size of Canterbury. About half the size of Canterbury. Um, we're talking about a small country. And yet, here's my proof positive picture that Israel is taking over the Muslim world. Can you even see it? And yet, if you'd watch the news today, you'd think that maybe it was really like this. <laughs> that Israel's just taking over. And, and this is the narrative that is so often shared. Unfortunately, when we ask the question, who are the Palestinians, we'd have to say that most Palestinians do not recognize Israel's right to exist. Even those 
who might be considered academics who are promoting Palestinian history and Palestinian human rights. Here's one author from the UK, Keith Whitelam, whose book has been positively reviewed in various academic journals. It's titled The Invention of Ancient Israel, The Silencing of Palestinian History. When he says the invention of ancient Israel, he makes claims like the following. Through a traditional reading of the Old Testament, now let me parse that for you, meaning like if you just read it and take it at face value. That's what a traditional reading of the Old Testament was. You know, like if you refer to traditional marriage, that's like how people married until five minutes ago. Um, that's a traditional reading. Or traditional family values, or, you know, traditional. If you have a traditional reading of the Old Testament, he claims that this is a Zionizing, propagandistic approach that silences a Palestinian past and a Palestinian history. He's actually making the claim, as an academic who should know better, that the Palestinian people of today are related to the ancient Philistines. Friends, no one ever claimed that until recently, when it could be politically expedient to do so. We'd also say, in answer to the question, who are the Palestinians, that they have no elected consensus. Mahmoud Abbas was elected Palestinian president in January 2005 for a four-year term, and there have been no elections since then. So it's very difficult to get unity, or even consensus in terms of, can we... Can we discuss the possibility of mutual recognition? Can we ask, what do you need? How can we meet your needs? How can we come together? Can we seek peace in some way? Can we have a two-state solution? Can we have a one-state solution? Can we have any solution? And what we find is, no, those who are speaking loudest are going back 70-some-odd years and saying what we need is the final solution, the elimination of Jews in Palestine. Let's be clear about this. When many who are saying free Palestine are shouting their rhetoric, you have to look at the map that they are holding up. The map is not the Gaza Strip in the West Bank. The map is not some version of peaceful coexistence. The map is the whole thing. Everything that is called Israel, and sadly you can see this on various uh, internet platforms, there have been difficulties even putting Israel's name on the map to recognize that it exists as a country. Some nation states refuse to even list it because they don't want it to exist. So it is difficult. In fact, we might ask the question, are the Jews occupiers of Palestinian land? And the answer, once again, is that the Bible and history show an enduring Jewish presence. When you dig up the history, you find Hebrew texts and Jewish artifacts. There never was a Palestinian state. If there were, you could go back and say, well, who were their legal representatives? Who were their prime ministers and presidents? Who were their governmental leaders? Who were the mayors of their cities? But there never was a Palestinian state. However, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, the Jewish state was formed on May 14, 1948. And in that state, it was not claiming to be a, an ethno-state only for Jews, though it was called the Jewish state. It had representation for all the peoples, Muslim, Christian, Arabs, Druze, various other smaller minority groups who could be represented in their parliament the Knesset. This, friend, flies in the face of claims of apartheid. Ask your South African friends what apartheid looked like. And then ask the real question, does that exist in Israel today? I believe you'd be hard-pressed. The evidence indicates otherwise. In fact, once again, when you dig up texts, I remember one famed Israeli archaeologist said that he had the privilege at Masada of picking up pieces of pottery and reading Hebrew letters in, uh, inscribed on, 
on clay tablets and holding them in his own hands. And it was the most touching thing to realize these have not been on earth for nearly 2,000 years. Are the Jews occupiers then of Palestinian land? Uh, This might be new information for some of us. But the term Arab in Arabic means desert, desert dweller. It, it really refers to a nomadic group of people who lived in various desert areas. From the west, they would have come from North Africa and such. Uh, from the east, as far as from India, but these people who travel along various trade routes were known as the Arabs. The family of Muhammad, by the way, was from Yemen and Africa and were not Semitic. In other words, not from the line of Abraham. And the modern Arabs include many various conquered peoples under the sword of Islam. Rafat Amari, in his helpful work called Islam in Light of History, traces this out from primary texts from various geographers and historians who interacted with the desert dwellers and who also documented the various claims of Muhammad. Mark Dury, a scholar from the UK, writes that the evidence indicates that Ishmael was not the father of the Arabs and neither was Abraham. The Ishmaelites were probably Canaanites, speaking not an early form of Arabic, but a dialect similar to Hebrew. In time, they disappeared or were absorbed into other groups, like so many other ancient peoples. Much later, it was the Jewish historian Josephus who invoked Ishmael's name to conjure up a genealogy from the Arabs. In other words, you can look in vain in the Bible or in other historical works seeking to make a direct connection between Ishmael and the Arabs. It's simply not there. Some common anti-Semitic tropes, however, do come from these confusions. And it all really relates back to the origin of anti-Semitism, which is a satanically inspired hatred of those that God loves. Genesis 3.15 is rather clear about how things are going to end. He shall bruise your heel. But it's going to be the seed of the woman who crushes the serpent's head. Knowing that there is this seed coming from the woman who is going to prevail. The serpent who is identified both in the first book of scripture and in the last book of scripture as the devil, the evil one, the Arch enemy, the adversary, ha satan in Hebrew, which means adversary, the declared enemy of God. He is the one who inspires this hatred against the seed of the woman, and not just any seed, but as we learn, that line of promise. Eve was already looking for a man child from the Lord, looking for the promise that God had made to solve the problem of human sin. To reunite God and mankind. And when Satan could not stop the line of promise from being fulfilled. You know he tried several times. You know it was with Moses that the male children under Pharaoh were attempted to be drowned in the Nile River. Killed at birth. It was much later under various peoples who would come against the Jewish people. And try to annihilate the Jewish people. Or under Herod, uh, when he had all the babies surrounding Jerusalem, I'm sorry, Bethlehem, killed. But when he was never able to stop the line, stop the Messiah from being born. And when the Messiah himself gave his life, a sacrifice for sin, and then rose from the dead. Powerful, victorious over sin and death. It's not like Satan's energy and anger evaporated. No, he continued to hate 
and inspire hatred against the ones God used to bring the Messiah in the first place. And so this satanically inspired hatred not only attempted to cut off the line of promise, but then to punish those who brought the Messiah in the first place. Thus, anti-Semitism, the hatred of Jewish people, starts already in the garden and is warned about in Genesis 3.15. Its source is satanic at the core. But here are some things that you might hear from those who want to make it possible, even for Christians, to hate Jewish people. They might say, well, the Israelis of today are not real Jews. They would make statements to claim that the Jews of today are Khazars. If you hear this term or you see it in a feed online or someone's a social media post, you can identify them immediately as falling for an anti-Semitic trope. The term Khazar suggests that they're coming from some area of Russia and they were imported to Eastern Europe and the claim is that all Ashkenazi Jews or, or Germanic-speaking, Yiddish-speaking, uh, Eastern European Jewish people, um, they are the ones who are, well, false imports and occupiers, colonialists who have come to the land of Israel. Of course, why would Jews have left Europe to come back to the land of Israel other than that they were being tortured and, and sent to gas chambers and, and being killed in the Holocaust? But also that God is gathering the Jewish people and bringing them back to the land. But to claim that they're Khazars is a way to say that they were never Jewish in the first place. These are just uh, Eastern European and Russian invaders who have come to this Middle Eastern land. Of course, the narrative would suggest that is rightfully to be identified with Islamic lands. One key tenet of Islam is that any time land has been conquered for Islam, it must forever be in the hands of Muslims. To add to the hatred is the common claim that the Jews killed Jesus. And yet, friends, can we just read our own scriptures and see what the Bible says about why Jesus died and who killed Jesus? Yes, Acts 2 verse 23 would tell us that it was a part of the predetermined plan and foreknowledge and counsel of God that Jesus would be crucified. But if we go back to the prophet Isaiah, we would read in Isaiah 53 verse 10 that it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And Jesus himself says in John 10, 18, no one takes my life from me, I lay it down myself. In fact, Isaiah 53 verse 8 says that he, like a lamb to the slaughter, gave his life for the transgression of my people. In other words, he intended to be, at the plan of the Father, the sacrifice to take away the sin of the world. As John one twenty nine says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus never could have been the saving sacrifice had he not given his life. This was all a part of God's plan. And in fact, many Christians further overlook uh, Jesus' Jewish identity and his connection to the Jewish people as a whole. They somehow think of Jesus as a cosmic Jesus, as, as, as maybe divine but not, not human. And of course, this is an early heresy that uh, eliminates the humanity of Jesus and, and may only think of him as deity. But to consider Jesus' own humanity must include Jesus' Jewish humanity. In fact, when you read the New Testament and open it to its first page and first verse, you would find in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the beginning of the genealogy of Jesus. I remember the first time I gave a copy of the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, to an Israeli friend. She already had a bachelor's degree in Jewish education and biblical studies from Tel Aviv University, so she knew her Hebrew Bible quite well, and she opened it to the first page. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, there are more interesting places I'd rather she read, but she's reading this genealogy rather thoroughly. And I'm thinking, oh, she could read this, and she could read that. And I, and, but, but she's studying these familiar names 
from her own Hebrew scripture. And she turns to her husband's, husband and says, Zevi, David? Did you know that Jesus is the son of David? Like, this meant something to her. This is how Jesus is introduced in the first verse of the New Testament. He's the son of Abraham and the son of David. This is how Jesus is introduced in Paul's magnum opus on systematic theology, the book of Romans. When in Romans chapter 1 and verses 1 through 7, his introductory comments, he mentions Jesus in verse 4, uh, verse 3, who is born a descendant of David according to the flesh. This is how Paul described the gospel. You need to know who Jesus is. He's born a descendant of David. In fact, it is so much a part of the way Paul shared the gospel that he says to his protege, young Timothy, in 2 Timothy 2, verse 8, which is fast becoming one of my most favorite verses in all of Scripture. Paul tells Timothy, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. Friends, do you tell the gospel that way? When you share the gospel, the good news of the message of Jesus, do you include the fact that he is Jewish? That he was born a descendant of David? You know, I suppose you don't have to. But it reminds me of the person who might try to summarize the, the overview of the story of Narnia and not include the fact that there was a lion, a witch, or a wardrobe. I mean, I suppose you could tell the story without mentioning those. You just wouldn't be telling it the way Lewis wrote it. And I suppose you could tell the message of the person of Jesus without mentioning that he's a descendant of David according to the flesh, but you're just not telling it the way he had it written and the way God orchestrated his human existence. Well, friends, when we consider these important issues, we also must go on to the subject of who is Hamas. Hamas was founded in 1987 as the Islamic resistance movement. And can I tell you, uh, drawing on a little academic background here, it has nothing to do with the Hebrew word violence. I've seen a number of folks who perhaps should know better uh, suggest that, ah, Hamas, it's the Hebrew word for violence. That's, that's who this group is. Um, can I discourage you from reposting this? Uh, this Islamic group would not have taken their name from a Hebrew word. It's an Arabic phrase, and in fact, it's an acronym. Like the word boat is an acronym, not a word. Have you heard bust out another thousand, you know, uh, or, <laughs> yes, uh, uh, or FBI, you know, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Uh, 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 Hamas is not a word, it's an acronym. Here, let me give you the Arabic. It's harakat al muqama al Islamiya. It means essentially the Islamic Brotherhood. It is not a Hebrew word for violence. It is the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine. A 2018 attempt to condemn Hamas for acts of terror at the United Nations, by the way, failed. Even though it's exactly what they are inspiring. On October 7, Hamas is the group that launched this Operation Al-Aqsa Flood, and its fighters broke through the Gaza barrier, attacked Israeli military bases and homes, massacred civilians, took hostages back to Gaza, and perhaps you've heard, and I won't share this with you in detail today, but the media has been invited in to view horrific scenes of the devastation, the mutilation, the barbarism of this group. And I would just say, take them at their own word. You don't even have to find that this is another group's portrayal of who Hamas is. It was their own cameras on their own weapons that were displaying as they sent back through social media, kind of like, look, mom, here I am murdering Israelis. They are the ones who were celebrating these atrocities. And... It reminds me of the importance of reading the Hamas Charter. And let's draw a parallelism to Hitler's work, Mein Kampf. William Schreier, Schreier, in his book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, said that not every German who bought a copy of Mein Kampf necessarily read it. But it might 
could be argued that had more non-Nazi Germans read it before 1933 and had the foreign statesmen of the world perused it carefully while there was still time, both Germany and the world might have been saved from catastrophe. It was written long before the events happened, telling exactly what Hitler intended to do. And friends, you can read the Hamas Charter and its 36 articles can be summarized as follows from this article adapted from Bruce Hoffman, Understanding Hamas's Genocidal Ideology, printed just recently in The Atlantic. I'd encourage you to read it yourself if you want to be that informed, but you could at least note these four summary items. They stand for the complete destruction of Israel for the liberation of Palestine and the establishment of a theocratic state based on Sharia law. This is what they want to accomplish. Number two, unrestrained and unceasing holy war or jihad to attain the above objective. Number three, deliberate disdain for and dismissal of any negotiated resolution or political statement of claims to the Holy Land. In other words, when your potential partners at the table have sworn your destruction, it's a difficult place from which to begin negotiations. And therefore, number four, reinforcement of anti-Semitic tropes and conspiracy theories to alienate anyone's appreciation of the Jewish state and of Jewish people. In fact, perhaps you've seen a meme like this one that I believe accurately reveals the two sides. One has its citizens hiding underground, defended by its military. The IDF is properly named the Israeli Defense Forces. They're not out to go and conquer other lands. They're simply trying to defend their citizens. Whereas the citizens there in Gaza are being used as human shields. And deep underground are munition factories, missile launching pads, and places for the terrorists to plot their horrors. Is the current conflict the fulfillment of Bible prophecy? Or is Ezekiel 38 unfolding before our very eyes? For this, I turn to my mentor and friend, Dr. Fruchtenbaum, in his famous book on eschatology, The Doctrine of Last Things, called The Footsteps of the Messiah, in which he writes that Ezekiel 38 and 39 describes an invasion of Israel from the north and subsequent destruction of the invading forces once they reach the area of the mountains of Israel. He goes on to say the most controversial question in the context of Ezekiel 38 and 39 is when? When in the chronology of prophecy will the Russian invasion occur? And finally, on page 126, he writes, the Russian invasion is another birth pang that will occur before the tribulation begins. Is this a fulfillment of that? Is this terror attack and, and the war that is now coming related? Well, I think it's important to note that we always understand prophecy better after the fact. Or as one philosopher, you might know him as Yogi Berra, once said, it's difficult to make predictions especially about the future. <laughs> How is this all going to turn out? Well, more important than even recognizing is this a specific prophecy being fulfilled today, we, we might put it in the categories, as Dr. Fruchtenbaum has done, of among those many birth pangs leading up to the ultimate tribulation period. And by way of application, we should live today like the time is now. How should we live any differently if it truly were a fulfillment of Bible prophecy? We should be praying for the salvation of those around us. We should be concerned and we should be praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Perhaps some of you have seen this very stone which exists on the grounds of the garden tomb in Jerusalem. It's a privilege to enjoy the mentorship of Dr. Fruchtenbaum and to note along. Um, history we've had of common interests, we co-authored in the following book, 
What Should We Think About Israel? I wish I had copies of it available for you today. Uh, others, uh, with a great love for the land and people of Israel, have chapters in this book as well. And uh, I hope that books like the ones for sale today and this one to which I would recommend you would encourage you to trust in the God of Israel, the one who never slumbers nor sleeps, the one whose eyes are always open to this place, and that you would seek to be informed of believers who would similarly pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Our time is up for this session, but I hope that you are armed with helpful information, that you would turn yourselves to the scriptures time and time again, not only to be informed, but so that you might actively pray and seek for the discipleship of others about these important themes. I look forward to being available to you throughout the day and to address with you in our next session a proper perspective on Israel and the Middle East.